once again officially welcome all of you here in person for the second day of our workshop. I would like to also welcome our online guests and thank them for their patience because we have some slight delay with our colleagues coming uh, a little bit later uh, that we have uh, announced uh, for, the, for the start. Uh, so I do not want to talk as much and I will directly pass the words to our colleagues who will, who will help the session on automatized metadata generation. And the first speaker should be Osma, also is here virtually. Osma should come and join us from the National Library of Finland. So please, floor is yours and you can start with your presentation on uh, AMIT and uh, FINTO subject heading systems. Hello everyone, my name is Osma Suominen and I'm very glad that I was given the opportunity to present my work here in this workshop. The title of my presentation is Automated Generation of Subject Headings with ANIF and Finto AI. I will describe how we developed our own solution for automated subject indexing and put it into production use. And in this presentation, I'm describing work um, that we have done together with my colleagues Mona Lehtinen and Juho Inkinen. And first, a few words about myself. Um, I work as an information system specialist at the National Library of Finland. Uh, I have a technical background. I'm not a librarian, but I've been working with different kinds of metadata for around 15 years now. I studied computer science and I completed my doctoral thesis about semantic portals in 2013. And I got a doctor's hat uh, like the one here shown on the picture. It's not the same hat that I'm wearing today. Uh, and uh, the same year, um, I joined the National Library, and my first assignment was to set up, together with colleagues, uh, a service for publishing controlled vocabularies. It later became known as Finto. Uh, and since then, I've also worked on publishing bibliographic metadata as linked data, and more recently, on automated subject indexing. As part of my work, I'm developing open source software, including Scosify, Scosmos, and of course, Anif. And here's the outline of this talk. I'll first talk about how we developed ANIF, and then I'll continue with quality issues, community building, ANIF deployments, and then I'll finish off with some lessons learned and some thoughts about the future. And first, some background about the development of ANIF, um, and also about subject indexing, because that's but it tries to automate. So subject indexing is the process of assigning documents, subjects from a control vocabulary, such as a thesaurus or subject headings. And at the National Library of Finland, uh, our main subject vocabulary is the general Finnish ontology YSO, which includes more than 40,000 subjects, if you include the places as well. And libraries like ours have very large collections of documents and uh, uh, performing subject indexing is therefore typically a very labor intensive process. And it would help if we could have a tool that assists us in this work. And this is not a new idea. Many automated subject indexing tools have been created starting in the 1960s, especially for the indexing of medical research articles. And there are plenty of commercial and non-commercial platforms that offer this kind of document classification services. But from our perspective, these tools usually suffer from a number of problems. Um, first of all, they don't understand our national languages, Finnish and Swedish, and they don't support the vocabularies we use. And last but not least, they are usually black boxes, which cost a lot of money. And if you buy them, you are then stuck with the vendor. So um, instead of relying on some existing tool or platform, we had the idea of trying to leverage our existing metadata and to use artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to help create more metadata. And um, a starting point was our main discovery system, Finna. It's a search engine for the uh, cultural her heritage collections of Finnish libraries, archives, and museums. And we decided to use the millions of metadata records in Finna to train machine learning models for automated subject indexing. And the first prototype of ANIF was created in 2017, uh, so five years ago. Uh, the technical implementation was very crude, but it got people excited. Uh, so in 2018, uh, we decided to start development on a new version built on a more solid foundation. And we decided on some goals and principles. So first of all, it should be multilingual because at our institution, we need support for at least three languages, Finnish, Swedish, and English. 
and it should be independent of the indexing vocabulary and should support different subject indexing algorithms. And it also, for practical reasons, it should have a command line interface, a web user interface, and a REST API suitable for integration with other systems. And last but not least, it should be community-oriented open source software. So not only do we make the code available, but also encourage others to use it and to contribute back, like we have done quite successfully with this Cosmos software that is running Finto. Currently, uh, all the development of ONIF happens on GitHub, and it's also made available as a Python package on PyPI and uh, as Docker images. And the algorithms in, available in ONIF, they fall into two broad categories. On the one hand, we have uh, lexical approaches such as MLLM and SDWFSA. These are mainly based on the string matching approach. Uh, so matching between terms occurring in the document and terms in the vocabulary. And these need comparatively little training data for uh, fine tuning the heuristics. And then on the other hand, there are associative approaches that are based on statistical and machine learning models. Uh, here, the idea is to learn which subjects are correlated with which words or expressions in documents based on a large amount of manually indexed training data. And both kinds of algorithms have their strengths and weaknesses, and in ONIF they can also be combined. And uh, as I hinted before, there are three ways of accessing ANIF. The first is the command line interface, which is used for setting up and for admi administering projects, training models, and evaluating them. And uh, there is also a lightweight web user interface for interactive testing of models. And, uh, and finally, ANIF can also run as a service where it provides a REST API so that other systems can be integrated with it. The REST API is really simple and the most important method is called suggest. It's given some text as input and it returns a list of subject suggestions. And each uh, suggested subject comes with an identifier, a label and a score, which is an estimate of how good the suggestion is considered to be by the algorithm. Uh, and if it is designed to be flexible, if you want to apply it yourself on your own data, you need to have a subject vocabulary and a set of training data called a corpus. And then you set up a project, load the vocabulary and train a model. After this, you can use ANIF to suggest subjects for new documents. Right, then moving on to um, the quality of automated subject indexing. And uh, uh, to be able to look at quality of automated indexing, we need to perform evaluations. And there are several approaches for evaluating automated indexing. And these were quite well summarized in an article cited here on the slide. Uh, first of all, you can evaluate quality directly by having evaluators assess the output of algorithms or by comparing the output to a so-called gold standard, which means that you need a set of documents that have been manually indexed and the indexing is known or assumed to be high quality. Second, uh, you can look at quality in the context of an indexing workflow. For example, how often the machine generated suggestions are accepted by users. And the third way is to look at quality indirectly by measuring information retrieval performance on automatically indexed documents. In practice, this is the most difficult setting to arrange as you would most likely need to set up a dedicated information retrieval system to be able to evaluate it. And uh, when evaluating automated subject indexing algorithms, we use common metrics. Uh, the most important ones are precision, uh, the fraction of correct subjects among the sub sub subjects suggested by the algorithm. And uh, recall is the opposite uh, of, of precision in a way. So uh, how many of the subjects that should have been suggested have actually been suggested. And uh, the F1 score is a combination of precision and recall. It's their harmonic mean. And it's often easier to use uh, just a single similarity measure instead of these two. And finally, the NDCG score is a ranking measure often used in evaluating information retrieval systems. And I won't go into details here, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's a good way of evaluating systems for machine assisted indexing where the algorithm makes suggestions that are confirmed or rejected by a human indexer. 
Right. So to find out how well different algorithms work in practice, we needed to collect some data for testing. And so we collected some pre-existing manually indexed documents from various databases and turned them into so-called corpora in a standard structured format. The same kind of corpora were also used for training the algorithms. We had to be careful not to test the algorithms on documents that had been used for training which is, of course, standard practice in machine learning projects to keep the training and testing sets separate. So having done this, we could then compare the subjects suggested by algorithms to the ones assigned by manual indexers. So this is called a comparison against the gold standard. And this diagram shows how well different generations uh, of our algorithms have performed on the same corpora. And the most recent scores that are shown here in orange are um, usually, in most cases, the best ones also. So we know that uh, uh, the quality has improved over time as we have uh, further developed our algorithms and uh, our methods. So uh, we know that this kind of comparison can be problematic in some cases. For example, if the manually assigned subjects are not of very good quality, which quite often happens with, with these kind of data sets. But it gives a ballpark estimate of how well uh, our algorithms are doing for different kinds of documents. Uh, another way to measure quality is to have human evaluators rate the suggested subjects. And we have organized two workshops where uh, evaluators were given example documents and uh, subjects of those documents that had been assigned either by humans or by algorithms. But they didn't know which is which, so it was kind of a blind study. Um, in 2019, we did this in a session with around 50 people in the room and in 2021 in an online workshop where we used uh, example documents from university repositories, for example, master's and doctoral thesis. Um, so you can see a summary of the uh, results of the later workshops uh, here in these diagrams. The blue bars are the quality scores given for subjects assigned by professional indexers, and the red bars are the scores for the best ensemble algorithm, which uh, wasn't quite as good as the humans, but uh, <clears throat> we also rated the indexing that was already available in the repositories, and it actually scored a bit lower than the algorithmically generated subjects. So we could see that the, um, um, what we could produce with the algorithms was uh, actually uh, in a way better than, than the existing indexing. And we have also published two uh, articles about the results, but they are both in Finnish. Um, right, and since ANIF has been used in some systems for some time already, we have also been able to measure how many of the ANIF suggested subjects are selected into the final metadata by human indexers. And the, the UPS repository of the University of Uvascula started using uh, the ANIF prototype early on. And at that time, around one third of the ANIF suggestions were accepted by users. Um, but with the new implementation of ANIF that used better algorithms, this increased to one half. And with successive updates of the algorithms and training data, the proportion of accepted subjects has continued to increase. Right, I'm moving on to community building. So uh, we try to make it easy for people to learn about ANIF. And first of all, we have a nice website, anif.org, with general information and a form like this that can be used to test the functionality. Uh, here you can see what subjects ANIF suggested for the text that I copied from the PDF program of this workshop. You can see that it's suggested, for example, cultural heritage um, and, um, uh, well, interdisciplinary research and bibliographies and so on. But it seems to have missed the aspects about automation and enrichment that were also uh, uh, there in the, in the program. Uh, on the GitHub project, we have extensive technical documentation in the wiki section. It's also possible to report issues and to contribute changes using pull requests. Uh, we have so far received contributions from Finland, the Netherlands, Germany, and New Zealand, at least. And um, together with ZBW, the Leibniz Information Center for Economics in Germany, we have created a hands-on tutorial to help people get started using ANIF. And we organized the tutorial for the first time at the SWIB 19 conference in Hamburg uh, as a physical event with 30 people in the room. 
And then when the world turned upside down due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we decided to turn it into an online tutorial with videos and exercises suitable for self-study. And inter interactive workshops have uh, since been arranged at the DCMI virtual uh, and at the, uh, SWIFT 20 and SWIFT 31 and Fantastic Futures online conferences, as well as an in-person workshop at the ELAG conference last summer in Riga. And the next one is going to be a tutorial at the SWIFT 22 online conference. You're all very welcome to join. All of the tutorial materials are freely available on YouTube and GitHub, so you can take a look and even complete the tutorial on your own. We've also set up uh, an unifused forum on Google Groups where people can ask for help and discuss their experiences. And we also use it to announce new releases and uh, unif related events. There are currently more than 80 subscribers in the group and please join if you're interested. Then uh, some words about where and how unif has been deployed. Uh, there are really two quite different ways of using ANIF. From our perspective, users fall into two main categories. First, there are those institutions, mainly in Finland, who make use of automated subject indexing services provided by us, um, which nowadays means using the Finto AI service that I will describe in a minute. This means that they do, don't have to use ANIF directly or to install it for themselves, uh, as they are just using API services or systems where ANIF-based functionality has been implemented. The second category here on the right is institutions who have set up their own independent ANIF installations and are making use of, the, uh, of ANIF as an open source software package. I will give a few examples of both kinds of use. Uh, first, uh, there are users of ANIF-based services provided by us. And uh, the first system that started using ANIF for semi-automated indexing in production was the UX repository of the University of Uvascula. They use ANIF to suggest subjects for master's and doctoral thesis uploaded as PDF files by students. So instead of the students having to fill in a blank form for keywords, they get a list of suggestions and collect, can select the most appropriate ones from the list. And they can also add their own keywords if necessary. This makes the process of uploading a thesis much easier for the students. And uh, the National Library of Finland also hosts a large number of DSpace-based repositories for various institutions, and uh, at least five of them have so far started using ANIF. And the idea is exactly the same as, as was in UX, but the technical implementation is a bit different. So automated subject indexing is rapidly, rapidly being deployed in the repositories used by Finnish university libraries. Uh, in May 2020, we launched Finto AI, an automated subject indexing service based on ANIP. So it's a companion to the Finto service that we use for publishing vocabularies. Uh, Finto AI provides a web form where users can paste in text, as well as a REST API that can be used by other systems. The ANIF REST API had already been available for more than four years as a prototype, but Finto AI turns it into a production service. Uh, Two years ago, we also integrated Finto AI with the system used for processing individual ele electronic deposits that are submitted to us through a web form. So it is the same idea as, as with the repositories. And the, the um, uh, Finto AI use, is used to suggest subjects for uploaded PDF documents and the selected subjects are then stored with the other metadata into the Melinda Union catalog. We also collaborate with the book distributor Kirja Valitus, which is a company that handles the logistics of selling both printed books and ebooks. And they aggregate metadata about new titles from publishers, they curate it and distribute it to bookshops and libraries. And when they receive information about a new book, they send the description text they get from the publisher to Finto AI and get back suggestions about possible subjects. And they select the most appropriate subjects and this information is then stored in our union catalog. And so when the National Library of Finland gets information about the new book, it already comes with preliminary subject indexing that has been created uh, with Finto AI. It it's, means less work for our catalogers and richer metadata that is available earlier than before. The examples I just showed were all built on the on ANIF uh, services we provide at the National Library of Finland. Uh, but it's, of course, also possible to set up an independent installation of ANIF and train it with custom vocabularies and data sets. So I will show a few examples of this. Uh, 
The Finnish pro- public broadcasting, the Finnish public broadcasting company Ule has uh, had been using a commercial document classification tool called Leiki for semi-automated subject indexing for many years, but um, they uh, they had to abandon that and to look at alternatives and um, they compared them and they set up an experiment where they uh, compared Leiki and Anif and uh, they uh, they had 28 human evaluators compared the the suggestions made by both Leiki and Anif and for Finnish language documents Anif was rated as slightly better than Leiki and for Swedish language it was much better so based on this and other experiences they decided to switch from Leiki to Anif and they made the final switch uh, some time ago already um, so uh, all the uh, Finnish and Swedish language online news articles are now indexed with suggestions from their own ANIF installation. Uh, ANIF is also being deployed in some German libraries. The ZBW that I already mentioned has been an early adopter of uh, uh, ANIF. Uh, sorry, I, I missed that on the slide. Uh, and then the German National Library has done a lot of de- tests using uh, both the DDC classification and subject indexing with GND, with the idea of replacing their existing system with ANIF. And they have also s- switched uh, uh, recently to, to using ANIF for subject indexing. Uh, one more institution that uses ANIF is the National Library of the Netherlands. They also have their own installation and have built, built uh, models around the Brinkman thesaurus that they use. And they have also built a tool to support the workflow, workflow of cataloging new documents with the help of ANIF. Okay, finally, the lessons learned. Uh, first of all, subject indexing is hard. There are no hard rules and some of the process is uh, inherently subjective. Uh, When humans do subject indexing, they can have very different perspectives and they sometimes make mistakes, but these are still understandable. When algorithms do subject indexing, they often make very silly mistakes, which don't seem to make any sense at all. Uh, In ANIF, algorithms may be used alone or in combinations called ensembles. The ensembles are nearly always better than the individual algorithms and they make fewer mistakes. Uh, We have started our efforts on automated subject indexing with the idea of machine assisted or semi-automated indexing. Uh, So the machine provides suggested subjects, but the final decision is made by humans. Uh, This works very well for inexperienced indexers, for example, students who are putting their thesis into a repository. And uh, the machine generated suggestions can also help achieve more consistent indexing and thus improve the overall quality of indexing. Um, uh, we thought that it would also help to speed up the process of indexing, but uh, it's, so far it's not clear if that's happening. Um, but at least we can tell that users like the machine generated uh, suggestions. It's harder to say whether the result is actually better. When it comes to fully automated indexing, we haven't really started doing that, uh, though it would of course be useful for collections that are, for example, that are so big that they cannot be indexed manually. Uh, But it's obvious that in that case, the indexing quality has to be very good. And it likely still isn't comparable to professional human indexing. Um, Right, and then uh, lessons from evaluation. Uh, There's no single best approach, but many complementary perspectives. And it's not a good idea to look at just a single measure, for example, F1 scores. Achieving good quality is a continuous and elusive process that never stops. And we have followed a process that started with experimentation and moved slowly in small steps towards production use. And this has worked very well for us and we intend to continue working in this way. Uh, When we have created an automated uh, subject indexing service, we found that it's actually uh, quite easy to start using it in new systems like the digital repositories I mentioned before, because the API is there, it's just a question of integration. The technical implementation can be easy, but explaining it to the users is, is the hard part. 
Uh, we have also had to consider from the start whether we should automate subject indexing using a commercial solution or to build our own. Both approaches have their merits. Uh, with a commercial solution, a library gets access to products and expertise uh, developed in the business world, but the solutions may not be a perfect fit for their needs, and there's the danger of vendor lock-in. With a do-it-yourself approach, uh, you need dedicated staff and expertise and uh, using an open source approach, it's also possible to nurture a community and to share solutions so that you don't have to implement everything yourself. We chose to build our own solution and so far we are quite happy with that choice, but it's not always easy to do so. Finally, we have found that collaboration is very valuable. Uh, uh, for example, we completed an EU-funded project together with CSC, the IT Center for Science, which provides Finnish researchers with supercomputing facilities. Uh, their machine learning experts have tested many state-of-the-art text classification algorithms for us. And in particular, they discovered and evaluated Omikuchi, which is by far the best individual algorithm in ANIF currently. And it has improved the results a lot. And it's ANIF has also been tested by the National Audiovisual Institute, CAVI, and of course, the National Library of the Netherlands, ZBW, and DNB, as I already mentioned. From them, we have gotten very good insights and suggestions, bug reports, publicity, and in some cases, also improvements to the ANIF code base, and of course, the tutorial. So we are not just giving the code away, we're also getting a lot back from the community. Here are just a few things that other people have said about ANIF, and they seem to be happy with it. Oops. <laughs> I like the last one. It, it cannot be worse than the hack we had before. <laughs> that's, that's the way to go. Uh, if, here are some of our future plans, always a bit spec speculative because it's driven by the needs of our users and these tend to change over time. But we are planning to expand our automated subject indexing services to more vocabularies, for example, the publish Finnish public library classification, uh, which is based on DDC, and the international theme classification, and also the Kauno ontology for fiction. And we want to improve the multilingual features of ANIF, um, for example, to add support for new languages and better support for multilingual vocabularies and perhaps also to integrate with machine translation systems. And there are also uh, requests to expand the scope of ANIF into language detection and to better support, for example, named entities such as people and organizations. And of course, there's always the general development work, making new releases, optimizing the code, improving algorithms, making it more usable. And uh, we plan to release ANIF 1.0 sometime next year. So that's also going to be a milestone for us. Right, and we are the team behind ANIF, and uh, here are some pointers to further information. The website anif.org collects basically everything, and then here are some uh, uh, two open access articles about ANIF. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Osma, very much. Head off to your speech. And uh, I would like to ask uh, David first question. Um, just from here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is great. Thanks for the presentation. And um, I would like to learn more about how Amit handles the PDF. Uh, you said uh, you can give it, uh, you can give PDFs to it. So uh, does it, um, does it uh, take away the, the non relevant parts of the PDF for you, like, like the running titles or? Uh, so anything that, which is not belong to the text body, does ANIF do this? Um, ANIF itself doesn't uh, at the moment process PDFs at all. It's just uh, just for raw text. So you need to pre-process the PDF first. And uh, so far we have mostly used a tool called a PDF to text, which is a very simple command line tool for Linux and um, other Unix-like systems. You just give it the PDF and it will give you the text. And um, it's really not up to us uh, what the result is. And it, it depends a lot on the original PDF. Sometimes it's very clean results, sometimes it's messy, and uh, sometimes it includes things that shouldn't be there. Uh, we have also been looking at other uh, uh, other tools or conversion pipelines for this, but right now we are just using this simple approach. 
and um, and this is also what what the API does. You, you you have to give it the text. So if you have P, if you're starting with PDFs, you need to first extract the text and um, uh, using some suitable tool. And in in general, for example, these these base based repositories, they already have this text extraction built into the system because they need the text for other reasons. For example, to to have the search uh, working in in uh, to search within documents. So so they already have the the extracted text and that's that's what they are sending to the api thank you osma the next question i have seen sylvia yeah i was just wondering if you could uh, or if you already have some tutorials on how to expand it to other languages like i, I understand you you would have to train it but like do you already have best practices of how to add a new language yes so um um, Anif is modular and um, most of the modules don't care about the language and basically the, what's language specific is well of course the vocabulary and uh, usually you give Anif uh, a vocab vocabulary in the SCOS format which is multilingual and so so you that could be in any language and then uh, the uh, other part that is sensitive to the language is the pre-processing done uh, using uh, module the, the the analyzer module which is uh, concerned with um, tokenizing the text and uh, doing normalization like uh, stemming or lemmatization and right now we have a few different analyzers already uh, implemented and these uh, support uh, quite a large number of languages actually and um, so we have uh, integrated um, the NLTK uh, stemming, um, snowball stemming from NLTK, which I think has 18 languages or so, mostly European ones. Uh, then there is uh, Spacey, which uh, is, of course, very multilingual. There are models in many languages. And, and the most recent one is uh, Simplemma, which is a very simple lemmatizer, which I think supports 38 languages at the moment. So uh, if you're lucky, uh, then you can just, you know, start using it. Uh, if, if any of these happen to match <laughs> what language you, you, you have. Uh, so right now it's, it's, it's already about 40 languages uh, supported altogether. Uh, and for the tutorial, there is, um, right now we are in the process of updating the tutorial materials and expanding them. And, uh, and one of the things that we are, uh, considering in the update is exactly this how to how to use it with with your own language and so there's going to be one uh, one exercise um, about uh, applying it to uh, well uh, well basically using a different using the trying trying out the different analyzers but yeah so this is a very frequently asked question actually about how does it work for my lang my language and uh, in, in many cases the answer is already yes okay. Thank you, Osma. I'm just checking whether there is some other question in the room. And if not, the first question online was the same as we have said, it's quite frequent question concerning the languages. So I will skip it if Gabina will okay with it. And then there are two questions quite similar. Is it possible to use ANI for harvested materials, that means web archive? And then if you have already tried to use ANI to index digitized materials, that means basically the OCR, which might be sometimes dirty. You can. Elaborate a little bit on that, please. Yeah, I think the answer to both is uh, yes, if you can turn it into text. Okay. Basically, basically for, for harvested material, well, uh, turning uh, harvested material into text isn't very hard usually. But of course, there might be boilerplate stuff on web pages that you would like to ignore, like navigation and, and stuff that you don't want to have uh, that are not important for the for sub subject indexing so you need to find a way to strip that maybe and for ocr materials well yeah uh, um, uh, i would say that the algorithms can be quite sensitive to to uh to ocr errors so if if the words have been you know mistyped or mangled then they don't match but on the other hand that can be compensated by the amount of text so if if uh if you just have a, a larger section of text, it doesn't matter if some of the words are wrong. If 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 it's, if it's still you know, if there's enough uh, uh, there that is that can still be understood. Uh, but 
basically you have to try. I, I can't tell you. We haven't used that much digitized materials. Usually we have been using you know, more modern materials that is already uh, in digital form from the start. Okay, thank you very much Osman for your input. Greetings to Helsinki.